So um, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Gráinne and I work for the Burnbill Trust and I'm joined this evening by uh, Jesmond Harding and by my colleague Mary Dunnan as well. Um, so tonight's talk uh, and our wonderful Wednesday webinars is um, Jesmond Harding who is going to talk about managing the burn for butterflies. Um, Jesmond is one of the of Ireland's foremost uh, butterfly experts and um, he is an active member of uh, Burnbill Trust, of Irish Peatland uh, Conservation and of Butterfly Conservation of Ireland, of which he is a director. Um, and he regularly gives uh, talks and advises on habitat creation and management, um, for, especially for species under, under threat of extinction. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Jesmond. Um, so welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much, Grania. Thank you, Mary. And it's lovely to be here this evening on a kind of a balmy July evening. And it's we're going to get some lovely weather in the next few days, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. The scene you're seeing there on, on your screens, it says burn habitat management, management of scrub and grassland for butterflies. Looking at that, it looks really spectacular. Nature at its best, summer at its best, and it looks so natural. And all of the plants you see in that in that um, slide there are native species. There's a lot of hawk bit, hawkweed, red clover, um, self heal, harebell, oxeye daisy, bracken, common hazel. It all looks great, really does. However, it's not actually really a natural habitat. It's best described as semi-natural. And what you're seeing there is the result of farming. It, it isn't the result of just nature doing it itself. There's, there is input from, from human beings and, in, and human intervention that has this habitat looking the way it does. And what I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to profile some of the rarer butterflies that we have in Ireland that have very specialized requirements. And by specialized, I mean, they, they only occur in very specific places under specific circumstances. And I, I'll go through each one and I'll explain a, a, a little bit about its, its life cycle and its requirements. And then I'm, what I'm after I go through those butterflies, I'm then gonna look at the management of habitats that, that make it possible for these species to exist in the burn. Right, I'm going on to my next slide. Now this is a brown hair streak butterfly and she's perched on bracken. Um, early, early studiers of butterflies in England thought the males and females were separate species because they look quite different. The female has those large orange patches on the forewing. The male doesn't. He's, he's all brown on the upper surfaces. And there she is basking on bracken there trying to heat up. That's mainly, it mainly flies during August. Now there's the underside and actually the underside is nicer than the upper side. Um, it's a butterfly very few people ever see. And although it's small, it's not that there's several Irish species smaller than it, but it's a really elusive species. It, it sticks close to scrub, rarely, rarely flies on open grassland. Now, this is the brown hair streak adult. By adult, I mean the adult butterfly. This is its macro habitat. It likes rich soil scrub and tall herb forest clearings. In other words, that's where the butterfly itself flies. Now you can see the scrub there and it's mostly hazel scrub with bracken, the edges and bramble. And there's also some um, common blackthorn, which is a very important plant for it. I'll explain why soon. Now, this is the brown hair streak adult microsite, sheltered, usually south facing, untrimmed scrub with a range of heights in the scrub. So for example, at the front of the hedge, there is smaller scrub and it's protruding or growing out from the, the main part of the hedge. And if you look closely, and I'm going to show you with my cursor here, you can see it's a, it's a rather scalloped, it's not a straight line hedge, it's a scalloped scrub edge. So these there are little heat pockets are in these areas here with young blackthorn here, which I'm circling now. And this is, this is the breeding plant. Now I'm going on to my next, Slide. Now, this is the brown hair streak ovum on blackthorn, and there in the fork and the blackthorn at the edge of the road at, at, at Knock and Row or Gortleka, 
near where the uh, the burn that in the burn national park there's the egg there and actually it's a really strange butterfly in that it's actually easier to find the eggs than it is to find the adults because the egg is laid in, in august and september and it sits on on naked blackthorn twigs and branches until the following april and against the dark branches the eggs actually quite stand out in, in england the main way of counting brown air streak butterflies is by counting, is by egg counts, because unlike uh, Ireland, in England, the, the brown hair streak behaves a little bit differently. It actually stays up in treetops, and some years no males are seen or very few are seen. Whereas in the burn, there aren't that many tall trees, so it actually comes down quite low. And, and males and females do. Now, there is the brown hair streak, larval microsite. You can see the caterpillar there. That's the little black thing in its head. It's actually feeding on the edge of a delicate leaf. If you look at the stem of the blackthorn, you'll see this is fresh growth. And that's what larvae do. They concentrate the freshest growth because it has a lot of nitrogen in it, essential for growth. Lots of, there's protein in nitrogen. So brown hair streak, larval microsite, foliage on young blackthorn shoot. Now, so that's so the black common blackthorn is the sole food plant really of that butterfly, and it breeds on those plants. Now here is another butterfly like scrub. It's a wood white, and there's a pair there on common bird's foot trefoil. Now this um, this butterfly is more or less restricted is is restricted to areas of carboniferous limestone in in Ireland. So it's found from Loch Corb down southwards to the burn and a little bit past the burn where there's uh, carboniferous limestone, bare limestone paved and bare limestone um, um, breaking ground. Now this is the macro habitat. Macro habitat means the bigger habitat of the wood white. It's open scrub and limestone and grassy forest clearings on limestone. And th these are little hot, hot places that it really likes. It likes hot, dry places to breed in. There is a very similar looking butterfly, oh, well, it's an identical butterfly that's found in the rest of Ireland called the cryptic wood white, but that breeds, that doesn't really breed in the burn, it breeds outside the burn, much lusher, damper habitats. But in Ireland, at least, the wood white likes really warm, dry, free draining habitats. Now, the macro habitat is the habitat you can see the adult flying around, but very often, the places you see them flying around are not necessarily the places they breed in. They'll often fly widely through a habitat, but they'll breed in very specific places. Now, there's the wood white adult microsite, which is a herb rich, open, medium height sward with a tangle of vegetation. So these are the areas just around the scrub here where I'm running my cursor. These are the type of places it usually lands and feeds all these areas around here, and it often hugs scrub. It does occasionally fly across open ground, but it's, you, it's mainly a scrub hugger, and it also, it's a scrub breeder as well. It breeds on plants growing right up against scrub, and you can see that this slide here. So if you look over here, you'll actually see the hazel just here where I'm circling, and these are the plants it's breeding on. It's breeding right up against the hazel. That's, that's what it does. So the scrub, the, the slide detail is, Wood white larval microsite showing vigorous growth of larval food plant in intimate contact with scrub in a sunny aspect. It needs sun, but it also needs some shade as well. Now, this is a marsh fertility butterfly. It's perched on purple moor grass. A lovely butterfly, that's a female. Now, let's go on to our next slide. This is the macro habitat of marsh fertility showing open humid grassland and heath. So wherever you get uh, heather, it, it's usually called a heath habitat, but it's a, it's a grass, it's a mixture of grassland and heath. It also occurs on cutaway bog, limestone pavements, um, dune slacks, uh, macro uh, grassland and eskers, pr provided the sward isn't too low. Now the adult micro, macro habitat showing the food plant in undulating sward undulating you can see the way that there are it's a kind of a, a a bumpy up and down sward it's not level it's not it's not this is not single height sward there are a range of sward heights here 
And the food plant is this plant here. And I'll show you in more detail in the next slide. This is it here. Very distinctive plant. Uh, it's a peren devil's biscabius is the name of the food plant. It's a perennial. It lives for, it can live for 30 or more years. So marsh should larval microsites with high density of food plant in tall but open sward containing dry leaf litter throughout spring. If you look closely here, you'll see kind of straw colored vegetation. Now this, is, this photograph was taken in summer, but this dies back to a bleached condition and that's very important for it. Now there's a, another look at it there. Now you can see it has a mixture of shorter and taller vegetation. You can see some of the vegetation beginning to bleach, beginning to dry, which creates a lot of warmth for the, this uh, species. You see the sensitive, the most sensitive phase in a butterfly's life cycle is the larval phase, because that's the phase where growth takes place. And if the conditions aren't right for growth, the, 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 the butterfly won't survive. Now, there's the marshallary larval microsite, so your larvae feeding inside a larval, larval web on the food plant. There's, there are the larvae there. They are probably first or second instar larvae. They're very young. Now, this is the marshallary larval microsite in spring. Now, you can see how bleached the vegetation is. It's dry plant material near food plant results in increased temperatures. And um, this, this animal requires its body temperature to be 35 degrees Celsius for food digestion. Um, and it can heat itself up to 20 Celsius warmer than surrounding vegetation. So that's vital for its metabolism. So what these are doing is these have actually fed on the food plant and they've gathered on mass to bask and heat up to digest their food. That's what they're doing. This is food digestion that's taking place here. You'll actually notice, if I slip you back to that side, they were brown pre-winter, but this instar, which is the fourth instar, it's black, and black absorbs heat and light more efficiently than brown. So that's the, the I suppose, the evolutionary trick it's pulled. It has developed a black coloring in, when, in spring because, and ready for spring, because in spring, there might be a lot of sunlight, but air temperatures are very low. So it really needs those warm, um, sheltered swords to heat up, but it must be unshaded. Here's another, here's a very rare butterfly, pearl border fertility basking in a fern. Here's the underside, and it's called a pearl border fertility because the little pearls, seven little pearls bordering the hind wing. This butterfly is in Ireland is confined to the burn. It's really endangered in England. It's, it's, it's I think it's declined by something like 96% since the 1950s. It's, it's a disaster over there. Now, is the pearl border fertility adult macro habitat of grassy forest clearings, unimproved dry calcareous grassland, limestone pavement. Now this habitat shown here is grazed throughout the winter and spring. It's actually generally sometimes grown for grazed throughout the year. And there's periodic scrub clearance here by the landowner. Now not wholesale, but kind of a little bit arbitrary, which actually suits it. Now here's the parabor fertility larval microsite violets and low herbs on dry, warm, sheltered, sunny situation containing leaf litter buildup against scrub. So see on this dry, these dry dead hazel leaves here, these perform the same function as the bleached leaf, grass leaf litter for the marsh tillery larva. It helps the caterpillar warm up. Now, unlike the marsh tillery, this caterpillar is not gregarious, it feeds by itself. So it needs an even warmer, more sheltered spot than even the marsh tillery. So this, this larva is right out of the wind, right up against hazel scrub. So it really requires really warm conditions. You can see the violets here. This is the larval food plant. If you look carefully here, you'll see a little half moon cut out of that violet leaf. That's diagnostic of feeding damage. That's, that's how this larva feeds. It, it takes notches out of leaves like this. And like the marshery larva has a little feed and scurries off to bask on dry, dead vegetation to, to digest its food. Now you can see it's actually quite sparsely vegetated, which is, it, it doesn't, it can't withstand lots of greenery. It's too cool in that case. And there's a close-up of the parabord fertility larval microsite. You can see it there. With feeding damage evident on violet leaves, you can see the damage here, here, and here, and here. So they've been quite busy. Actually, what it does is in 
cool or damp conditions or at night time, it actually roosts in the curl of, the, of a dead hazel leaf. So that leaf litter is really crucial to it. You can see bracken leaf litter here too, also very important. Now, Parborf Shirley Larva, microsite leaf litter used by larva for basking, concealment, and overwintering. So you can see that those elements are vital. You see, this explains why per, the, the food plant common dog violet is common all over Ireland. It, it's everywhere. It's in every ditch. It, it occurs in open grassland, it occurs on, on, on sand dunes, but why is the butterfly so much rarer than the food plant? Because the other conditions needed don't exist except in the burn. In other words, it has to be free draining, can't be damp, can't be wet, it can't take those conditions, it has to be free draining, it has to have an abundance of leaf litter, it can't be densely vegetated, it has to be sheltered, it has to be warm. Now, here's a dark green fertility bass in the bracket. This is flying around now, really big, powerful butterfly. It, it, it looks like it's a, it's like, it looks hyper when you see it. It looks like, it, it actually gives you the impression of a butterfly that actually never lands. It does land, but you just don't think it does. And there's the underside, lovely silvery spots here. Now, it's at the adult microhabitat is unimproved, dry, calcareous grassland, limestone, pavement, macker, dunes, and cutaway bogs that are be have become vegetated with flowers. Now, the larval microsite scrubby habitat use same scrubby habitat used by the parabola fertility larva, but dark green fertility larva also use medium height species rich grassland in a sunny aspect, like at Fenor, for example, or Fahi North. So it, it has a broader range of, of larval habitats, larval microsites than the parabola fertility does. Now, dark green fertility larval microsites showing violets at the edge of scrub on limestone pavement. So you can see here the violets are here and here as the edge of the pavement. They, they, they prefer little more open habitats than the parabola fertility. Now that's important because it it, it provides a degree of ecological separation. You, you don't want two larvae, two species larvae competing on the same larval food plant. So there's a, a little degree of ecological separation. The larva is found a little bit further out from the scrub usually than the pearl board fertility. Although there, there is some overlap, but again, it, it's not gregarious, it feeds singly. So that, that also lessens competition. Now, we're on to habitat management here. Now, here we're looking at a fresh clearing. You can see where the material is cut and laid here. A fresh clearing, as in scrub clearing, through scrub on limestone, which opens up breeding habitat for wood white, hard border fertility, silver wash fertility, which is a different butterfly, and dingy skipper. So this allows light in. This has a sunny aspect, particularly this edge of, of the, the, the um the clearing here. And I often find that clearings that have an east-west orientation really work well for butterflies. So that management input, which is purely human intervention as people cutting the scrub, it's really, really important for butterflies. Now, we're not talking about scrub elimination. We're talking about scrub control. You can actually see regrowth here by hazel. If you wiped that scrub, the wood white, power board fertility, silver wash fertility would disappear. It needs the scrub. It's an important element in its habitat. It provides the right conditions of shelter and shade for those larvae to develop. Otherwise, the larvae would just desiccate. Now, here again, we're looking at habitat management. So we have violets in fresh clearing growing among dry moss. So if we have a really forensic look at this, we see a nice clump of violets here. Lovely fresh growth growing among dry moss. You can see it here. Leaf litter, we can see the leaf litter. Uh, violets showing feeding damage caused by pearl border fertility larva or larvae. And you can see that the damage notches cut out of it here. Now you might say, well, Jasmine, you know, that's great, but where's the larva? The larva is a really, really careful feature. What it does is it has a quick feed and it scurries away. 
and it actually leaves the food plant and goes off to bask. And sometimes it actually hides in the leaf litter and in really warm conditions, because they, they can't control their own body temperature by sweating like, like we can, they actually go into cover under the leaves. So that material around them, is, it really, really matters. Sometimes they actually see this twig here, they actually bask on this. And it's a really, really strange creature. I've actually filmed it doing this. Sometimes they'll bask on a twig that's above the larval food plant. And when it's finished, finished basking and wants to have a feed, it just it jumps from the twig and lands on the food plant. It lands, lands on its feet. They're actually really good at doing that. Uh, it's strange to see it because it doesn't look that agile, but it really is. Now, in terms of managing, cut material should not be placed on the sunny side of scrub edges. Put it, put it in the shade spots, because if you do that, you're actually covering habitat for, for the power board fertility and the wood white and the dark green fertility. Now, here we have sunny, freshly cleared ride viewed from the south. So you avoid extensive scrub clearing. In other words, don't clear too enthusiastically. Scrub is vital to create a warm microclimate, shelter and habitats vital to Lepidoptera. Overclearing is a disaster. So you clear it you, you, and you can see this scallop edge here. That's, that's also good because it creates sheltered spots and a variety of conditions. So clearing gives a big boost to uh, herbaceous plants that were kind of you know, skulking in the shadows or sometimes the seed in the soil doesn't get grow because it, it's shaded but that suddenly gets a boost of light and begins to grow. Now, this text here, clearings and scrub grazed extensively throughout the year produces a low open flower rich sward favored by most of the grassland butterfly species found in the burn. Now, this, this would be considered overgrazed by some conservationists. Um, it's grazed by cattle and horses and they have, the two animals have a different grazing pattern. Now, because this is fine leafed vegetation, um, it's, it's not, there, there aren't dense grass species here. The, it, it, can, it can really, it can be overdone, but if the site is big enough, the animals can wander and it, 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 they don't overdo the grazing. Grazing and poaching of scrub edges induces fresh growth and germination of common dog violets and may even be essential for parabord fertility, dark green fertility, and silver fertility larvae. You see, the larvae in spring really need delicate, fresh, tender food plants to feed on. And if they don't get it, they, they just won't survive. They won't, they, their mouth parts are quite small and undeveloped at that stage, and they really need delicate plants, and they need the nutrients that fresh growing plants have. So scrub clearing, Call, creates, brings in light and allows plants to germinate. So for example, I have found pearl, um, pearl borderary ova on scrub that we cleared in, Mar in say February. And in May, the, they're, they're already being bred on from in absolutely fresh clearings. So it really does work. Now the poaching done by animals and the grazing done by animals really helps too because if the plant gets a knockback, if violets get grazed, they'll often produce a fresh flush, a fresher flush of growth than they normally would. Now, you might say, would it not eat the caterpillar? Power border fertility caterpillars and silver and dark green fertility caterpillars, when they feel something being touched or feel an animal's breath, they drop into the vegetation, they drop off the food plant really quickly. They don't hang around, they, they scurry away. So the bit of grazing, a bit of poaching, and poaching is very important. Poaching is when an animal uses its hooves to disturb the soil, and that allows violet, seed, uh, violet seeds to grow. Um, most plants will not, most wildflowers will not grow in a closed sward situation. They need bare patches to grow. It, it's, it, it's like you going to the shop and buying a load of wildflower seeds and, say, and looking at the picture on the, on the pack and say, oh, brilliant, my garden's going to look like this. This is fantastic. And going in and chucking the whole lot in your lawn and you sit there and say, well, what's happened? Where, where are my wildflowers? They won't grow. They won't grow in a closed sward. They can't reach the soil of Germany. Or the alternative, you're very good. You prepare your soil, you dig it over, nice, fine, crumbly, 
you throw your wildflower seed and you rake soil over them, that won't work either. They need light to germinate. So don't bury wildflower seed. You place them on the surface of the soil and forget about it. Poaching does that. It breaks up the soil. And when, when seed is uncovered or when seed lands on that, that gives it the opportunity to germinate. Um, periodic scrub control, creating a patchwork of clearings on limestone paper are probably vital. Now, in habitats that work for our rarer butterflies, you don't want to make very, very dramatic changes in a habitat usually, unless, unless the habitat's totally unsuitable. It's, it's often piecemeal scrub reduction and scrub, scrub cutbacks, not getting rid of scrub. Um, and scrub doesn't sound a very nice name. Uh, shrub sounds a bit better, but that they, these are plants that are, are really important for, the, for temperature regulation. They have played a big role in the temperature at the ground level and also shade. You see, the larvae often feed in the sun, but they scurry into, they, they'll often scurry into shade when it gets warm because they, they need to avoid being burnt out. So there are, there's lots of um, uh, very, very thinly vegetated, open limestone pavement with violets on it, but you won't find cardboard fertility larvae there because they, they burn in the sun. So they need the scrub for shade. Um, scrub clearing exposes violets to sunlight, making them suitable for breeding. And by scrub clearing, I mean cutting it back. Um, now, if it's 100% scrub cover, like it is in some areas of the burn, building big clearings into those areas with scrub surrounding with light pouring in, that is a good idea. And in that situation, eliminating some areas of scrub will, will, will be needed. Now, I'm looking here at the marsh artillery larva microsite. So you have a sward height of between four and 12 inches as 30, 10 to 30 centimeters. That's what's usually needed on those sites for that butterfly. Taller sward can become dense and shade out the larva food plants. A site containing a range of sward heights benefits a range of other species. So just down here, if you can pick them out, there is an adult dark green fertility roosting in the tall sward. Now, this, is, this plant here is black bog rush, it's called. Now you can see the amount of senescent kind of senile grassy material in it. That's very important for a number of butterfly larvae because they need to heat up. They often bask on dry material. Now, this is what an overgrazed habitat looks like. This lacks warm sheltered hummocks and tussocks used by the marsh tillery for breeding. There is, there is devil's bit scabious, the marsh tillery's larval food plant in this area, but it doesn't use it for breeding because the, the structure of the sward is wrong, plus it's green and green is cold. It need, they, need that, they need a thatch of dead material to breed on for, for breeding purposes. Now, this is grassland habitat management here, and we can see the cattle there, uh, Fahi North. These are Hugh Robson's animals. Extensive or sporadic cattle grazing maintains high quality habitat is essential for the survival of our butterflies. Grassland maintenance also requires periodic scrub control, leaving mainly open sward with scattered scrub. So the aim of scrub control and, and light grazing is to create a patchwork of short and tall sward with patches of scrub. Now, um, this creates a range of conditions that suits a range of species and caters for the range of requirements a single species may have. I, I'll tell you what that means, the range of requirements a single species may have. If you look at the speckled wood butterfly, the, sp or the speckled wood butterfly breeds on grasses that grow at the edge of scrub. But the adult often feeds on scrub, like a bramble, and they'll often mate high up in the scrub. So therefore, it requires tall scrub for mating and perching, lower scrub containing bramble for feeding, and the grass stand at the edge for breeding. So th there's your range of conditions that, that you need, that, that exemplifies that species requirements. Light cattle grazing, in other words, low densities, midsummer to early autumn dry conditions, uh, that's, that's what's often needed. Uh, you know, there, there are a, a, there's a lot of technical detail around 
stocking rates and timing and so on. I'm not going to go through it here. I'm not altogether a huge fan of it. I'm not really convinced by it. I think every site is different and you have to actually look at each site carefully to see what's needed, especially when you've got really scarce and rare species or really sensitive species in those areas. Um, year round grazing could be suitable if the stocking rates are low enough. And this allows for low selective feeding to keep undulation. Low selective feeding is usually associated with cattle. Um, sheep are selective feeders. They go and look for the nicest, tastiest flowers and they gobble them all up. So if you walk across the Curra and count it there, it's like a green desert. I mean, it's, it's semi-natural habitat, but the sheep will graze it down so low, there's almost no flowers there. The only thing it won't touch is gorse, um, stinging nettles and thistles. They won't go near them. Everything else is just, just leveled. Um, horses are similar. Horses' teeth are at the front of their mouths like donkeys, and they graze very, very low too. But cattle are different. They wrap their tongue around, around say, a tuft of grass, and they pull. And then they'll move a little bit, and they'll do it again somewhere else. So they actually have it leave a patchwork of grazed and ungrazed areas. They also have a habit of not grazing around their own cow pats. So that also leaves areas ungrazed. So that gives you a patchwork of sward heights. So cattle are really, you are, are really the preferred grazing animal. Now, th there are exceptions to that rule, but not necessarily in Ireland. So for example, in parts of England, where there'd be species that we don't get here, like the, like the silver spotted skipper, they usually need a really, really tightly grazed sward. So they'll often use sheep in those circumstances, but we, we don't have that species here and we don't need that. Um, light poaching creates gaps for germination and poaching, sorry, I've just gone ahead there. Poaching and grazing creates nutritious regrowth of food plants high in nitrogen, which is essential for larval development. Cattle rarely graze on, on, on unless they're neglected and overstocked. They rarely graze below about six centimeters. So they're, they're really useful. That, that's about the tolerance level for marsh fertility. Anything below six centimeters is a problem for that butterfly. So cattle, that's what cattle do. Uh, they, they, they're really, really useful animals. As well as that, if you need an area poached, in terms of managing the animals, if you put your water trough there, your supplementary feeding area there, they will often gather on that and they'll poach that area. Now, why, why would you want something ground poached? Well, you might want to look after the dingy skipper, which feeds on common birds for trefoil, which tends to breed on, on poached, which tends to occur on ground that's been disturbed or being poached. So th there would be reasons for poaching an area or even over poaching an area. So cattle are a vital tool. Now, another thing cattle do is they also remove, when they're eating green material, they'll also eat dry material too. So they will remove some of the dense thatch that can cover vegetation, that can cover growing vegetation. Now, we've already established that marsh tillery and some of the butterfly species need dry material to feed on. So that's where your timing of grazing and your stocking rate comes in. You don't overdo it. Um, so for example, if it's a really wet summer, you pile cattle onto a site and the site is, has fairly damp soil anyway, you can cause a lot of damage. So you, you, you do need to exercise care and graze according to the circumstances. So there is a bit of an art in it. Um, the habit in the burn of grazing the uplands in winter, that has a major effect of removing the dense thatch that can cover that, that, those areas of grassland. And that's why you get the orchids thriving because they, they, they don't have to grow up to a dense thatch of vegetation. And when that dense thatch of vegetation degrades, it, it changes soil chemistry and nutrient levels and will, to the disadvantage of some of the more sensitive flowering plants, which in turn has implications for rarer butterflies and moths. Um, so cattle are a vital tool in maintaining the burn and the burns flora and the burns butterflies. Um, Another vital tool is the Burren Bio Trust, and we can see the volunteers here controlling scrub at Fahey North in 2010. And I think I think that was September. 
uh, it was September. And uh, cutting the scrub keeps that habitat open. It's a wonderful site, it's lots of rare species on it. And by doing that, it's making sure that the, the habitat doesn't become shaded because shaded food plants, in other words, plants that no access to sun, that they, they're very rarely used by, by butterflies. It's just too cold for them, especially in the Irish climate. Now, thank you very much for listening. And I'm in a position now to, I think, to take questions. And uh, I think um, Mary or Grania will be asking those and I, I'll try and address them as best I can. Hi, Jesmond. That was absolutely fascinating. There was an, a lot of information there. Um, thank you. And lots that I hadn't heard before. Um, we have a couple of questions in the- Yeah, the sure, yeah. Um, so uh, the first one I'll ask you is um, Colin McLaughlin asked, mm -hmm. um, how do you tell the brown hair streak egg from other butterflies' eggs? Um, that, that's a good question. They, it, it, it's a very distinctive um, egg. There's the, the, only, the only species I can think of that lays an egg uh, like that is a blue border carpet. It's, it's a moth. But what, what the, it looks like a sea urchin. It's a pitted, the egg has a pitted surface and they nearly always lay under a spine or in a fork in on the previous year's common blackthorn growth and are usually laid between under two meters height, usually about one meter actually. And all nearly always on a south facing side on, often on young plants that grew out from, sh from runners under the ground at the edge of scrub. Um, it's actually a really distinctive egg. Sometimes they lay two or three quite near each other, but it's usually, they're usually laid singly. The egg as well is as tough as nails. They, they're, they're nearly indestructible. I mean, I've known eggs that hatched and this, the eggshell is still on the plant three years later. They're really, really tough eggs. It's meant to be tough because it has to sit on the, on the twig from, from August to April. So it, it has to be hard wearing. Okay, and, and did you say that we, we don't practice egg counting in Ireland as a survey method? No, it's, it's not used here. Probably the personnel aren't, aren't there to do it. Um, it has a, it's one of these strange butterflies. It has a kind of a cult following in England. It, it has its own Facebook page. They call themselves the hash brownies and they just, they go counting eggs outside prisons and everything. It's, it's really, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a kind of a, I, I don't know what it is. It, some people just like that butterfly. They just they just have a feeling for it. It's not really glamorous looking to be. I love it. I, I really do. It's a color of an autumn leaf. I just I just really get it. And some people really just adore it. There's a prison I think near Oxford, and there's there's a lot of blackthorn around, and people go there every winter counting the eggs, and they 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 get great fun out of it. It's it's a not, and the thing is, in winter when there's not much, there's no butterfly watching going on in winter. So it's kind of your survival diet really you know your but butterfly lovers hate winter we we just withdraw into ourselves and kind of die a death really in winter time so it's vital sustenance to sustain us through the bitter bleak winter months so i think that's probably one of the reasons for its appeal great great answer thank you for that no problem um, i have another question here um while it sounds like the burn is doing quite well in maintaining butterfly habitats Mm -hmm. um, is it enough? And uh, how is the rest of the island doing? Uh, in your, in your there's, there's things that happen in the burn that I don't really like. Um, not all of the burn is protected. So you, you do get nibbles, farmers, let's be honest, farmers and landowners nibbling away at habitats, like putting gates in and clearing scrub and using diggers to put tracks through it. And I, I get quite upset when they see that. How's the rest of Ar Ireland doing? Better, better than the UK, but still not great. I mean, a real bugbear of mine is, is, um, is the bog destruction. It's a, it should be a national scandal, really. It's, it's absolutely despicable. And I, I really hate, I really hate to see it. And it's going on in protected sites legally protected sites, despite the existence of enormous financial penalties for people doing that. 
that that destroys really good habitat for for butterflies and moths. Um, on burn type habitats elsewhere, like you know dry limestone grassland. We, we're not doing great on looking after our, our flower rich habitats. Our, the, the assessments for EU protected habitats do not make good reading. They, they really don't. The last one was done in, published in 2019. If you want to be depressed, go and read it. I mean, that's the tr honest truth. It really is. Um, there's a beautiful site called Killaglan Grasslands in Ross Commons, about 10 minutes drive north of Athlone. It's a mini burn. And it's a stunning place, but years ago, someone bulldozed a load of it. So, you know, we have to care more and love our habitats more. We, we really do. And otherwise, we'll be in a situation that they're in the south of England where they have really, really small sites that are protected, but they're tiny. A lot of those are tiny. I mean, I've, I've, I've brought people from England around, say, Lillymore, Lillybeg and Kildare, and they can't believe the scale of the place that they find. They said, oh my God, this place is huge. And the burn, they just collapse when they see it. They, they just can't believe it. Because in, in England and Wales, you're down to really small places and there's no freedom. You're, you're walking past crowds of people. There's no feeling that, you know, that lovely wilderness feeling that you get in, in, in Sheskin Moor in Southwest Donegal, the Burren or, or the Wicklow Mount. You just do not have that in, in, in a lot of other European countries. So we're, we're still lucky in that sense, but the bog destruction is the big black mark, I feel. Thanks, Jasmine. I'll hand you over to Mary, maybe, to yeah. another question. Hi, Jasmine. Um, Hi, Mary. How are you? That was a fantastic talk. I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. So it's really, really interesting for me. Um, I was out in the burn walking today, and we saw some... Um, but somebody said there were pearl border fertilities they were moving dark so fast. green dark I green i think they might have been that's oh, why yeah. i was thinking from looking at your program, yeah it's dark so. green pearl borders are over they're over ah, yeah. so yeah, you're seeing they're, dark green fertilities they're beautiful they really they are were absolutely just, stunning and they move yeah. so fast it was unbelievable um just um i work a lot with communities and there's a question here that interests me and um, is there anything the average citizen can do to create butterfly friendly habitats in their garden for example yeah there there are yeah um now, it's very unlikely that you can say pearl border fertilities or dark green fertilities in a garden because mm. it, it, it's just not the habitat for them. But there's, there's an awful lot you can do in a garden. Also, there's a lot of damage you can avoid in a garden. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. I, I don't know if you've seen this, Mary, but in, in parts of the burren and parts of other parts of Ireland where there's free draining limestone habitats, you can see plants like red valerian, Budlia, um, Tony Astor, they are not good. That's bad news. They're, they're really, they're alien invasive species. And if you have a garden in or near the burn, please don't plant those plants. Th they will get out of your garden and into the burn in a very, very short time. So avoiding damage is one good thing you can do in your garden to conserve the wider countryside. Another important thing you can do in your garden is Plant native plants. Don't be going to the garden centre buying you know, the really showy ornamental plants that often stand back in your garden centre and just watch the plant and see if any bee goes near it. If there's no bee going near it, there's nothing there. There's nothing there of interest for wildlife. A lot of those plants are bred for colour and smell. They're not, and they are bred species. They are bred plants. They are not natural species. They're hybrids and cultivars. Grow native plants. Take seed, the, the burn's not gonna fall apart because you take a few seeds. Take seed and scatter it on a, on, a, uh, on, an, on, on a low fertility part of your, your, your garden where there's plenty of sunlight. Make sure the soil is bare and crumbly and just scatter seed and then walk away, forget about it. Just forget you ever planted it and see what happens. That's one thing you can do. Planting native trees and shrubs is another excellent idea. I mean, I've had hundreds of moth species in my garden just through native planting. And it, this, this, this native planting, it really works. It, it's, it's a no brainer. It, it, you'd be amazed what, about what turns up in, in a native planted uh, situation. And look, look at good quality wild habitats and try and copy the structure of those habitats. So taller tree, scrub, 
uh, tall vegetation, short vegetation, try and copy the structure of those habitats. And that will cater for different species as well. Um, now, there's, you can do a bit of cheating by getting the buddleia in. And, you know, that's like opening a pub and you get loads of butterflies coming to it. But the leaves aren't eaten by butterfly larvae. It, it's kind of a cheap, it's a bit of a cheap shot. It's a very nice cheap shot, but that's what it is. If you really want to encourage them, grow devil's bit scabious, grow common knapweed, you know, grow common birds for trefoil, grow the plants butterflies feed on in the wild, and you'll get them not just feeding, but breeding in your garden as well. Fantastic. That's great advice. So avoid invasive species and grow, oh, yeah. uh, grow native species. Yeah. Um, there's just another one question here that um, I am very interested in the answer myself. Um, what happened before um, conservation bodies like um, the burn conservation volunteers started managing the or started to help in the burn? What, was it just enough on its own, like say what the farmers were doing? Yeah, the, 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 the farming, the, the type of farming practice in the burn was very suitable for, for wildlife because it's low intensity. The stocking rates are quite low. There aren't, there's no, there weren't any chemicals being used on those areas. They weren't, they weren't spraying them. They weren't fertilizing those upland grasslands. Too difficult to do anyway. And um, they were cutting. Par, farmers were cutting wood, for firewood, and for fencing and, and hurdles in the past. You know, so they were they were doing a lot of that themselves. So that that helped. The the kind of the uneconomic nature of farming in the burn now has meant that conservation farming has to be used, has to be applied to maintain those habitats because it, 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 the, the farming, the scale of farming needed to make a living in the burn just isn't, isn't there, not on its own. So that's why conservation bodies are needed. But in the past when subsistence farming was practiced and was in some way viable and appropriate for people's lifestyles at the time, farmers did cut scrub and did, did create those conditions themselves. Okay, very, very good. So I, I, I understand what you're saying that they were using the landscape in a way in the past that uh, created the perfect habitats mm. for these butterflies, but um, not not so much anymore, which is where uh, the volunteers um, come in. Um, Grania, have you any other questions there for Desmond? Um, I have another one. Yeah, um, there's one here in the in the chat. Um, um, can we reintroduce brown hair streak to places um, like in the Midlands where, um, you know, very lightly farmed and just perfect? Um, you know, how can, how can we do it? It's very strange to look at the brown hair streak in Ireland because it, it's, not, it's not a limestone pavement butterfly in England. It occurs on fairly heavy soils there. So, I, I mean, why why it's so restricted to those areas in Ireland? I, I'm not sure it's down to soil type. I'm sure I think it might be down to the fact that the, there's you see, there's one key vulnerability about the brown hair streak, and it's this. Because it lays its eggs on last year's blackthorn growth, it's looking for the really delicate new leaves to feed on. And when you strim a hedge, it removes all that growth and removes the eggs with it. So there was a study done in East Anglia where uh, an egg count was done and they, they strimmed the hedge and it removed every single egg. It removed 100% of the eggs. So I think it was, in other parts of Ireland, it's, its absence is probably due more to management of hedgerows than for anything else. So if there was a bit of neglect practiced on a, la on a, on a fairly big scale, and not just one field, on a pretty much a landscape scale, yeah, you might be able to reintroduce it because I mean, blackthorn occurs everywhere in Ireland. I, I, I think, and you know, I, I don't see why it's apart from the fact that hedges aren't cut like that in the barn because you can't drive machinery over rocky limestone pavement; just can't be done. I think that might be the reason it's not in other parts of the country. So my answer is a tentative maybe, if they were allowed to grow wild and, and allowed to grow in a scrubby fashion and, and see it sends underground runners that plant uh, and to put up new plants. That's, that's one of its methods of, of reproducing itself as well as by seed. If it was allowed to do that, it, it, may, be a, it may be possible to introduce to other parts of the country. Okay, so, so a, a management maybe of every three years cutting or, you know. Yeah, and not cutting. And, and what you do is you, 
you don't cut all of it in one year. You cut maybe a third of it in one year. Okay. So uh, you always leave a large area uncut to maintain the, the butterfly so that you don't remove eggs. Yeah, great. Um, can you recommend any resources, any good resources for um, butterfly identification and um, or even... You know, yeah, there's um, the Butterfly Conservation Ireland website. There's a gallery. If you click on that, every every Irish butterfly is pictured on it. Um, you can, if you if you have a butterfly query or you want to know anything more about butterflies, or if you, you took a snap of something or a butterfly moth, you want to know what it is, what it is. If you email conservation.butterfly at gmail.com, we'd be happy to respond, or even send it to Butterfly Conservation Ireland's Facebook page. You'll get an answer there too. So we, we're we're good at, at butterfly or moth. We, we were happy to, to provide an answer. Okay. And these little um, ID guides from the National Biodiversity. They're, they're good, yeah. The swatches, yeah. Coming through those as we were talking tonight. Um, there's a bit of information on them, but they're, but they're lovely to have to hand. Yeah, they're very nice. Yeah, they're, and they're, hand, they're good because they're, they're waterproof and you can stick them in your pocket and, and bring them out with you. The Double Naturalist Field Club also produce a very nice um, kind of a a waterproof um, poster as well. It's kind of a folded and um, you can get it on, you can order it from them. It's very nice, very attractive. And that, that's quite useful. It's not quite as handy as the swatch because it's bigger, but it's still, it's still pretty useful to have. Okay. So that's the Dublin Naturalist Field Club. Field Club. Yeah. Okay, I've put that into chat now. So yeah. um, I've just written that in. Um, Mary, do you have any, any further questions? Um, I think that's it. I can't see that we've missed any in the chat there, Grania um no we're good yeah to say that it was a uh, very very interesting talk and um i look forward to passing on what i've learned to any of the communities that we will uh, be working with right thank you very much thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about butterflies and management of the burn and um, the burn's looking really wonderful at this time of the year and it, it looks wonderful through throughout july and august so if you have a chance to get out there and have a look and enjoy what's there the area around um, the crossroads at, at Gord Lecker or Knockin Row, whatever you want to call it, is that the fields around there are just really special and yeah. a beautiful walk. And even if you see no butterflies, the walk itself is just breathtaking. So get out and enjoy and um, try something in the garden. Try even try a herbaceous bed with nice native wildflowers in it and, and, and a sunny sheltered spot and you will be rewarded. <laughs> Great advice, Jasmine. Thanks very much. Thank Take care, we, uh, just to say to you, Jasmine, we have loads of lovely messages here, and I think everyone is as as fascinated as we were. And thank you so much for your time this evening. It was it was really thank really you. It was a real it, it was a pleasure. I I love yeah. doing these things because I, I I the more people care about wildlife, the better protected it will be. Absolutely, hundred percent agree. Um, and just for everyone, just want to remind as well. Um, next month on the eleventh of August. Uh, we will have Bats of the Burn with Kate McEnay, um, and that's at 8pm as well. And uh, registration links will be sent out to members as well. Um, so in advance, but Jasmine, thanks a million for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jasmine. Take care now, everybody. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Bye -bye. Take care.